I'd be brief in specific questions, and if you could do likewise, we'll get through all we need to get through here today. So, to, to lead on from the previous question, in a way, do you accept that we had a derogation from domestic water charges under Article 9 of the EU Framework Directive in 2000 at that time? That's the first question. Secondly, what is your and the Commission's definition of established practice? in relation to the delivery of water services, as mentioned within the Water Framework Directive. And moving on to the River Basin Management Plan 2010, which you did mention, and which you believe, in your opinion, constitutes the loss of the initial interpretation, if you confirm it, of the directive dating back to 2000. So are you saying, if that's the case, you are implying that there's a shift in your interpretation of established practice. And what is your view on the legality of the suspension period that we are in presently? Because that too, in our opinion, allows for the achieve because we still feel we can meet the achievements or the, 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 the objectives of the Water Framework Directive. And finally, if, have you been in contact with the CEO or the EPA in relation to your contention, your belief, your opinion that we, were, we are in contradiction of the EU Framework Directive? May I kindly ask you to spell the full name of uh, the uh, entity? Uh, the, 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 the energy regulation. Uh -huh. Who's been charged with responsibility to act For on energy behalf regulation? of the public in relation to the implementation of the framework? Yeah. Yes. The regulator. The Irish regulator. The Irish regulator. Yeah. Uh, so your first uh, question was whether you had, so believe it is not for the European Commission to grant uh, this uh, derogation. It is uh, for each member state that uh, demonstrates it's, it meets the elements uh, to uh, claim the application uh, of this uh, derogation. But of course, if the Commission challenges you didn't uh, challenge this, it. so we haven't challenged you it haven't, so in the past. It. We have accepted that it Thank could you. have applied, Thank you. but at that moment, okay. before the filing of the first river basin management plans, the problem of the derogation was not uh, that uh, actual it has become actual for each member state when it has filed its plans. Okay, so your answer yeah. is you do accept yes. that we, were, yes. we weren't challenged in our interpretation of the derogation based on the directive in the year 2000. That's your, that's your, you've answered that? Yes. You, but to you didn't challenge it? Yes. 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 Fine, that's, make, all, that's all I wanted to know. Yes. Uh, now, I, I don't mean to be confrontational, I mean to try yes. and establish facts in relation to your opinions and our opinions and I how understand. they're implemented and ultimately the courts will decide if, it's, if, if, if they're asked to arbitrate. What's your but definition of established practice? Yes, I am coming to your question about the established it, practice. Yeah. So, uh, the river basin management plans uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, demonstrate the, the practice. application interrupt an established practice. So you no longer have an established practice. Okay, so, so you accepted the interpretation of the established practice initially, but you sought to shift your interpretation of it when, this, mm. when you got the river base, basis plan. No, we that, did not that is shift correct. our interpretation. No, we did not shift our interpretation. What is your interpretation? We noticed of, of that the Irish authorities have changed policy and have taken the decision to apply water charges and not to make use of the paragraph 4. What's your definition of paragraph 4? What's your definition of established practice? 
Here I prior, would prior, prior rather to turn to my uh, colleague uh, Jorge mm -hmm. uh, to kindly ask him to... Yes, thanks very much. Um, good afternoon. The term established practice is only used in paragraph 9.4 of the Water Framework Directive. And uh, paragraph 9.4 uh, has certain conditions attached to, to it. It's a derogation from the obligations to establish a water pricing policy that are in Article 9.1. Uh, these uh, conditions, among these conditions, uh, there is that the Member States shall report the reasons for not fully applying Paragraph 1 in the river basin management plans. So we consider that 9.4 is applied at the moment where the river basin management plan is adopted. And there is where uh, any uh, recourse to this, uh, to this um, exemption should have been done if, uh, if, uh, if appropriate. Yeah, well, established practice in, in, in my mind and in the Irish government's mind and the Irish people's mind at that time was that it was paid for our general taxation. Anyway, you decided to change your interpretation of it on submission of the river basis plan, and that's your right to do so if you so wish. We don't agree with that, and if there's to be an adjudication on it, it's beyond our control. That's, that's all I'd say on it. In relation to the, the legality then of the suspension period. What's your interpretation of that, considering that it too relates back, in our opinion, to, to, to the initial derogation and the objectives within it and our establishment of an established practice based on it being paid for our taxation in the year 2000? Because it would bring, it, 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 you would question the legality of this period if, if, you, were to, if you were to follow on from your, 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 what you've just said. Yes, and uh, I've uh, already replied to your uh, question about the legality of suspension when I've said that uh, currently we believe that uh, Ireland is not in compliance with the Water Framework uh, Directive from, from uh, because of the suspension okay. of the water charges. And we disagree in relation to the yes. contents of the, uh, we disagree with the, the, the implementation of the Directive and, and the basis by which you arrive at that conclusion and we believe we are on a solid ground in relation to our basis for our conclusion. And finally, saying what you've said and interpreting it in May the way I in which you have May I continue my had, answer well, can, you? Can, no, no, you, you've, I've, I've heard enough, to be honest. But in relation to the CER and the EPA, have you been in touch with them considering uh, your, your comments that you just made? We have been as a general, uh, as a matter of uh, general uh, cooperation that we have with all the uh, national authorities in the member states, but not in particular on this uh, subject. Not in particular on this subject? Yes. Okay. Yes, and I would like to draw your attention, this is what I wanted to add, and I will be very brief. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that Article 9, Paragraph 4 allows Member States to invoke an established practice, but it says clearly where this does not compromise the purposes and the achievement of the objectives of this directive. Yeah. And you have heard me uh, earlier in my intervention pointing to a number of objective uh, elements which show the distance between the uh, current situation and the purposes and the achievement of the objectives of this directive. Yeah. Yes? That's where we differ. That's so I want to go, uh, Mr. Bradley, just want to come More in with, later, a, yeah. with, with, with a follow on answer or comment to Mr. Mr. Chairman, Collins. First of all, I appreciate uh, Mr. Dia's answer. I mean, I think it's a very interesting answer and it's a useful answer because. The objective of the Water Framework Directive, as Mr. Jaya has outlined at the very beginning, is about uh, quality, not quantity. And if you look at Article 9.4, I mean, it's very, very interesting to look and see what the actual terms are. Um, the actual reporting of the non-compliance or the der derogation is in the report that's in the River Basin uh, Management Plan. That's where it comes in, is the reporting of that. But the reference to a uh, 
established practice. I mean, it's a very, very important point, and I think it's something that and I'm sure <coughs> Mr. O'Dell isn't that familiar with established practice when it comes to Irish law, but um, I can tell him that in 1962, there are some key dates in relation to uh, ascertaining what established practice are. 1962 is the beginning of it, where the Public Health um, Amendment Act 1896 was amended. You then have a date in 1983, another keystone date. You then have a date in 1997, in 2007, 2013, and now currently in 2016. And in order to ascertain established practice, one has to look at the range of what the established practice in fact was. And when the directive came into force, the established practice was not to charge. And if one looks at the history of the established practice in Ireland, and it's very much, and the deputies and senators in this place would know this very well, it's very much tied in with local government. And um, the responsibility of the elected members versus the executive members. So it's quite clear in my respectful view that the established practice does apply in the way in which I've described it, which is you look at the history of the established practice and the established practice at the key date was not to charge. And in fact, when he refers to the basin plans or the river basin management plans, that's the reportage aspect of it in terms of Article 9.4. And the key, the key phrase is the established practice. And could just mention one other matter in relation to Article 9. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Dardale would be familiar with the recent decision from the ECJ. Now, it involved a hydroelectric plan where the Commission took Germany to the ECJ on an infringement action, and they lost. But what came out of that case were very important principles. And I do accept it was about a hydroelectric plan, but it was the first challenge under the Water Framework Directive. And that decision has been recently upheld in a case taken by the Commission against Austria, where the ECJ again confirmed what uh, Mr. Dodeo has correctly set out here, is the margin of appreciation or discretion that's given to a member state. So it's about quality, not quantity, and it's about the margin of appreciation given to a member state. And it's very important that the Commission are aware of that, and I'm sure they are, that that margin of appreciation was emphasised in the uh, ECJ decision. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. That, that comment, this conversation is really important to us, as you accept, so I'm fine to let it flow on. Is, is if a member state in the River Basin Management Plan demonstrates that they can meet the objectives of Article 1 and has an investment plan through general taxation and government borrowing to support that, my question is, particularly in the context of the German case, and I'm interested in Matthias and Connell's view of this, how could you be in breach of the directive when you're meeting the uh, objectives of Article 1? Uh, and I just think the, the detail of that case is quite important for members, because it is ECJ case law for members to hear. Uh, you've only got to look at, for example, the recitals to the directive to see what the purpose is that's to be found throughout it. It's, it begins with water is not a commercial uh, product like any other. It goes on with um, there are diverse conditions. Uh, the directive aims at maintaining and improving the aquatic environment in the community. The purpose is primarily concerned with the quality of the waters concerned. The ultimate aim of this directive is to achieve the elimination of priority hazardous substances and contribute to achieving concentrations in the marine environment near background values for naturally occurring substances. Uh, it goes on and it recognises that member states can look and should look at diverse national um, considerations. When 9.4 was introduced and the derogation, it was known colloquially as the Irish derogation, it was specifically to meet the conditions that existed in Ireland, where water had not historically been charged for in, in that way. Moreover, when the Commission first proposed this, it did propose full cost recovery, and during the conciliation process, that was dropped. And that was recognised in the German case as significant. It is significant. It's not about cost recovery. Just look at the directive itself and see what its purpose is. Improve quality of water. Deliver high quality water services. It is not about cost recovery. Uh, and if Ireland can demonstrate, or for that, other, that matter, any other country, but certainly in the case of Ireland it's relatively easy, because Ireland has had this established practice. 
And you don't cease to have an established practice, in my view, as a lawyer, and despite some of the comments that were made earlier, I am not a member of any political party here or anywhere else. I gave independent legal advice. But if you are, uh, have an established practice, that remains the case, particularly when large numbers of people still adhere to it, until you can successfully put in place something else. You have here a system where it substitutes out of general taxation, seen from the point of view of the public, that is, the public are not reaching into their pocket in order to pay for it. If you are to change that, you have to put something else in place. Nothing else was successfully put in place. That is why, in my view, it is quite clear that the derogation does continue to be available and is available to Ireland to use uh, to the fact that we had, as I set out in the note that I was asked to do for the committee, uh, if you attempt unsuccessfully to change an established practice, it means you haven't changed it. It continues to exist by definition as a matter of logic. So, therefore, when the Commission, when it said on it, maybe said that, well, the Commission may do A, B, and C, and D, that indeed is true, but we live in a system uh, of democracy governed by the rule of law. <clears throat> and the Commission does not have its way as so that if, for example, the Commission says no, it means no. We have a legal system which tests this, where there are procedures which must be gone through. And I know from experience, having litigated before the Court, the Court does not always agree, far from it, with the Commission. The Commission regularly loses cases before it. So the mere fact that the Commission uh, takes a particular view should not influence you to believe that that is the view which will prevail. Far from it. It's a long, it's a process. The Commission have got to come back, set out fully its position, notify Ireland of that, hear what Ireland's got to say, take account of it, be satisfied that it does actually impede or uh, compromise the Directive's purpose. And I believe on that alone the Commission's going to have a very, an uphill task, it's going to be rather difficult in my view. And then they've got to go on and satisfy the court that Ireland was in breach. As I say, if you take it down to basic principles, established practice, it is, I find it very difficult as a lawyer to understand how you can say that that established practice, given what has happened, uh, is not still in operation. In my view, it is, and it avails Ireland. No, thank, thank you. you. I, I appreciate that. You've also outlined that in the submission, yes. uh, Matthias, that you've given us. There were four key areas. Polluter pays, incentivise efficient use, full recovery, not part of the directive, uh, not established practice, and as a result, uh, we're not, we are in compliance, in your view. Clonet, do you want to come in very, very quickly? Because I really want to move on, if I may. Just, I, there are, we're, we're a bit narrow. This is important. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, just to be very brief. Very brief. Um, I, mean, I do accept Monsieur Dordeau's emphasis on margin of appreciation, but it has to be margin of appreciation to the Member State. It can't be margin of appreciation by the Commission. They can't have it every way. It either is a margin of appreciation or there isn't. And I said at the outset that the German case involved hydroelectric issues, but there are points of principle established by the Court of Justice of the European Union in that case, which are terribly important. And if anybody wants to read them, they're at paragraphs 47 and 51 of the judgment. But there are important points of principle that apply. And I suppose to put it in a summary fashion, in my view, Article 9 doesn't say or it isn't an absolute requirement to bring in charges. Article 9 is about um, river basin management. And Article 9 has to be read in the context of, and you can look at this later, I won't go into the detail of it, but you have to look at Article 11 and Article 5 and Article 4. Those are the, and when the, when the ECJ looks at this, they look at it from a holistic perspective. And it's about quality. Mr. Jadeh was absolutely correct. It's about the quality, not the quantity. It's about quality. And in relation to 9.4, just very briefly, um, you know, established practice, we have to look, I mean, I won't go back into the Public Health Ireland Act 1868 or 1879, but you have to look at the way Ireland dealt with it from 1962 to last year, 2016. And the key date, and everybody's looking at key dates, but um, when the directive was in force, charging was by way of taxation generally and there was an established practice everybody who's worked in local authorities will know what went on between the elected members and the executive in terms of service charges okay, Willie and then Jan yeah, look, 
my, my head is spinning from established practice. Uh, can I just ask Mr. Uh, what's Dardia? You know, he seems to be saying, you, sorry, can I just ask you, you seem to be saying that if a practice has, you know, continued in a country for many, many years, and then there's a proposal, a proposal to change it, suddenly it ceases to be established practice, and the proposal becomes established practice. I mean, why is the word established used? It's not changed practice, it's established practice. Would you not take Mr. Kelly's point that if you have an established practice, it remains the established practice until something workable is put in its place, and clearly that hasn't happened here. Now, can I just ask you again, you know, without getting too much into the complexities of this, I mean, it, it, if you look at the, uh, the, the article, the relevant article, you know, do, are you saying that in order to meet the objectives of the article, you have to have a system of individual payment? I mean, you know, if you're talking about polluter pays, I mean, if the taxpayers generally are paying, I mean, sure, you know, the polluter pays principally surely met. I mean, where does it say or where does it, where does it imply or direct that there must be an individual charging system? And if, there is, if, 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 if that is indeed what it implies, if there is something in the directive that says that, have you taken any legal action against uh, Northern Ireland? They haven't complied as far as they haven't an individual charging system. Have you taken any legal action against Scotland? I mean, you know, are we the only people that legal action has been taken against? Because, as you say rightly, there nobody is above the law, but nobody is below it either. You know. So, so the other thing I want to ask you is, you know, what is the relevance of the directive to metering? Is metering? I mean, you know, does the directive encompass the provision of metering, or would district metering be sufficient? Or do you need any kind of metering at all? like to uh, kindly invite my uh, colleague Jorge, who might be more pedagogical than I am able to be. I hope. Thank you. Well, I will try. Um, 9.4 is an exemption to an obligation. So the exemptions are, have to be interpreted narrowly. The exemption uh, in 9.4 is to an exemption to an obligation to establish a water pricing policy in accordance to the cost recovery principle and to the polluter pays principle, the latter being part in the treaty, by the way. Um, this uh, exemption is therefore, in our view, needs to be interpreted narrowly. When before the first river basin management plan was adopted, we wrote that established practice at the time of adoption of the directive is because in order to apply 9.4, we believe that must have been established practice already by the time of adoption of the directive and must have been consistently maintained until the adoption of the river basin management plan. And in that river basin management plan, the member states would then give the reasons why even not applying a water pricing policy, which is according to, to the cost recovery and polluter pays principle, would anyway meet the objectives of the water framework directive. This is the sense of the addition, and it's a pity that Mr. Murphy has left the the room of uh, the addition that we did in 2010 to this uh, established practice at the time of adoption of the directive. So this is to avoid that a member state, for example, in 2006 would abolish water charges and then claim that this was established practice. It is a not, it is not a, a symmetrical uh, issue. It's, is, it has to be interpreted narrowly because it is an exemption. And it cannot, uh, I mean, it recognizes long, uh, long standing experiences, long standing behaviors, not. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, no. no. And in relation to metering, because I think it has been. Uh, Race. We made our intervention at the beginning related to metering in the context of the recommendations from the expert commission. The expert commission recommends that 
a charge for wasteful use of water is implemented in Ireland. This is for you to consider how to do it. What we are saying is that the only way to do that is to implement metering. Metering for domestic users is general practice in the whole of EU with very few exemptions, very few exceptions. Some of them you have uh, uh, invited to give, uh, to give evidence to this committee uh, recently, which is uh, Scotland, for example, and some parts of, uh, of uh, England and Wales to uh, different levels, and Northern Ireland as well. Uh, the rest of the EU is using generally metering for domestic uh, households, is generalised. Um, so it is a very well established practice, if I may use this uh, word as well, uh, to, uh, to uh, promote uh, conservation and to have a, a, a fair uh, water charging system in place. You mentioned Scotland and Northern Ireland, and I think we, I should refer to what uh, my colleague, Mr. Giovanni D'Odrea, was uh, saying about the need to look at the obligations of the Water Framework Directive not in isolation. Article 9 is there to support the achievement of the objectives of the Directive. That's why, as Mr. Bradley was mentioning, it is part of the programme of measures, this water pricing uh, policies. What I'm saying that? I'm saying that because what is what the Commission could reproach Scotland and Northern Ireland as regards the water services if they have compliances close to 100 per cent. Their urban wastewater treatment uh, directive compliance is close to 100 per cent. This is not the case in the Republic of Ireland. Well, anyway, the fact that you, you said that the use, uh, the use of metering is generalised. No, my question was, is there any requirement in order to comply with the EU directive to have individual metering? The fact that it's generalised doesn't, nece doesn't necessarily mean that there's any requirement to have individual meters. And, and the, sorry, can I, can I just ask you? So you are saying, you are say, you are saying then by 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 admitting that you're not take, you don't think it's appropriate to any action against Scotland. Uh, that uh, individual charging is not, it's not really, it's not, it's not essential under the directive to comply with the objectives of the directive. Sorry, I didn't understand I said, the last I said, part. I, I'm saying that if you're not pursuing Scotland, what you're saying basically is that actually impl implying individual charges on householders is not required under the EU directive. One of the obligations of the water pricing policy is to provide adequate incentives for users to use water resources efficiently. This cannot be other thing that, than uh, related to uh, water quantity, by the way. This, in order to provide adequate incentives, metering, as I just mentioned, is a very well established practice across uh, the EU. So you can provide incentives to, it's use, it's to it's use water resources efficiently by implementing metering. Is there any evidence? There is, however, provisions for to depart mm. from these obligations of the directive, having regard to the social, environmental and economic effects of the recovery and geographic climatic <coughs> conditions of the region or regions affected. And this is. Yeah, sir, just come in there and correct me if I'm wrong, but the EU average of metering across the EU is 65% of domestic households? No, no, it must be much higher. Much, it's much higher. higher. 26 member states used generally for domestic uh, households, for domestic uh, uh, um, pricing. Metering. Okay. So generally, this doesn't mean that every individual household is metered, because I think one of the issues that was raised in previous uh, uh, in previous uh, discussions in this committee was that old buildings are difficult to 
fit with That's new meters. Challenge. So yeah, I'm sorry, I want to go back, Willie, because I, I jumped in there. Uh, I'll just back to you again if you want to finish. No, I think Mr. Brown okay. just wants to make a comment. Sorry. Um, Deputy D asked a very important question, uh, Chairman, and just wanted, for my own sake, to clarification it, that um, there is no requirement for charging for individual householders in the directive. I think that was the question that was asked, and I gave the example of Scotland, and I understand the, the answer to that is yes. There is no, uh, there is no uh, explicit requirement in the directive, but the directive, my colleague pointed out clearly in Article 9, Paragraph 1, second subparagraph, requires also that uh, member states shall ensure by 2010 that water pricing policies provide adequate incentives for users to use water resources efficiently. The best and large scale used incentive to use resources efficiently is metering. This is what we are saying. Conservation in yes. your book at all. Is there any form of conservation other than metering and charges in your book? Obviously Scotland have it, obviously Northern Ireland have it, why can't Ireland have it? In addition to the established practice I might add. I rest my case.